here uh, tonight. I, I know the holidays are a very busy time and you have made it a priority to spend some of that time focusing on Christ and his coming. And so we welcome you. We thank you that you are with us and we really do hope that this is your best Christmas ever. We have been in a series entitled Christmas Extras. But I just want to ask you this evening, if you were able to look at what the perfect December 25th would be, what would that picture look like? Maybe the, the right Christmas playlist with your favorite holiday songs, hopefully not with Mariah Carey every five minutes. <laughs> your favorite Christmas foods with no fruitcake. And maybe someone that you cannot wait to see is coming to your house. Or maybe someone you're not so excited is not coming. There's just enough snow to make things look nice, but, but not enough that would ruin any travel plans. And that just what you wanted gift is waiting for you under the tree. And you're going to watch your favorite classic holiday films, and you're going to drink cocoa, you're going to sit around the fire with your favorite children. That's what it looks like, right? Well, let me tell you right now, in advance of that for tomorrow, it is not going to happen. That's all I got. Please stand for a closing prayer. <laughs> Here is the truth that we all know. Christmas never is perfect. No matter how much we try, no matter how much we plan, no matter how much we hope, something always goes wrong at Christmas. And we all know this because we've all tried to put up Christmas lights and we've all have our epic fail moments on that. Maybe not as bad as this particular one. That is, um, I did that back in 2015. It was my attempt to put up Christmas lights in my front yard. I named it the Beacon of Hope. It was so dang bright that my neighbors actually complained about it. And it was not exactly what I was going for. You see, something is going to go wrong on Christmas. I mean, this is Christmas 2020. Need I say more? A toy will break. A meal will get burned. You're going to get something that you don't want and have to pretend that it was a great gift. You'll, ruin, you'll run out of batteries. Somebody's going to get sick. Somebody's going to be late. Somebody's going to drink too much. Isn't it true? That the most wonderful time of the year is often the most stressful time of the year. For some, this will be the first Christmas since you lost your job. For some, it's going to be the first Christmas since they were deployed. For some, it will be the first Christmas since the divorce. For some, it'll be the first Christmas since the doctor gave you the diagnosis. For some, this will be the first Christmas you sit down at a table and there's an empty place. In a movie entitled Meet Me in St. Louis back in the 1940s, Judy Garland sang this little song to her younger sister who was depressed at the prospect of having to move away. And she sang this line from this song. Have yourself a merry little Christmas. Let your heart be light. From now on, our troubles will be out of sight. Seriously? I mean, if you can just have a good enough Christmas, if you can just be merry enough, all your troubles are going to go away? When do troubles ever recognize any holiday? Those aren't even the original lyrics to that song. The original lyrics said this. Have yourself a merry little Christmas. It may be your last. Next year, may, may, we may all be living in the past. That's not quite as cheery as the, as the, as the other song that was sung, but, but here's the truth. We all know this. Life is hard, and expecting perfect only makes life harder. Do you know who should know that better than anyone? Is people like us who believe the Christmas story really happened. Because if you ask Joseph and Mary, 
They would say there was nothing about the birth of their first child that was picture perfect. There was an unplanned pregnancy with all the scandal that went with that in their culture. There was a rushed wedding that nobody celebrated. And then right at the end of their pregnancy, there was an unexpected and very hard trip. And when you arrive, there's no place to stay. I wonder if Mary didn't say to Joseph, seriously, you didn't get reservations? Because in my estimation, that's the real reason it was a silent night. <laughs> And there were all these uninvited guests. And you have this nut job as a king that's making death threats against your babies. So you have to pack up and move as immigrants to a foreign country just to get away from him. And that never gets put on a Christmas card. Because that's not a pretty picture. But it is a picture of a beautiful truth. And that is this. That Christmas reveals God's heart for an imp perfect world. Have you ever gotten a gift that was more trouble than it was actually worth? A woman wrote into the Reader's Digest years back that she had an aunt that liked to knit and would typically make her Christmas gifts, you know, uh, maybe get a cap or a sweater or a throw. But the last Christmas, she got a box from her aunt and she opened it up and it was just a big ball of yarn, two knitting needles and a note that said, Scarf, some assembly required. <laughs> a lot of us are frustrated with the fact that we don't know how to fix this mess. Because the world is not perfect. It was created perfect. God is not the one that messed it up. We did. And heaven's response to an imperfect world was not to shout, fix it. No, heaven's perfect answer was to send the perfect as the answer. See, the Bible says in John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. You see, a broken world will never cause God to break his promises. Christmas is heaven's announcement that God's not going to give up on you or me. God is not going to look at the mess that we've made in this world and even the mess that we've made of our lives and turn his back. God is not going to be so repulsed by our imperfection that he's going to abandon us. In fact, Christmas says that God's perfect plan is to bring the perfect back that has been birthed. See, hundreds of years before Jesus was born, a prophet predicted his name is Isaiah, and here's what Isaiah said. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. In other words, hundreds of years before Jesus was born, the prophet said, someday he's going to be in charge. Someday he's going to rule the world. And it will be the way that he wants it to be. And you know what we'll call him? Wonderful counselor. Mighty God. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, the perfect Son came to guarantee that the perfect world will be restored. The way things are is not the way they are going to be. Someday we won't need a funeral home. Someday there will never be any divorce courts or oncologists or rehab centers or nursing homes. God's heart for an imperfect world is greater than just his heart to fix it. In other words, Christmas is offering more than just hope for a perfect future. It is offering a way to cope in the meantime with a very imperfect present. Because Jesus wants to give us a gift. A gift that we've always needed. And deep down we know it is the gift that we've always wanted. Right before Jesus went back to heaven, here's what he said in John 14. I'm leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. Do you know what you need more than anything to live in the world and the way that it is today? You are not going to find it under a tree. You will not find it in Jordan Creek. You're not going to get it from Amazon online. FedEx will not deliver this. 
the gift we need the most is a kind of calm and a resolve and a joy and a hope in our spirit that allows us to be the people we really need to be no matter what is going on around us. Because here's the deal. The problems that we have on December 24th are going to be there on December 26th. No matter how hard we try to make December 25th perfect. But when life is far from perfect, we can still be very close to God. Because Christmas offers the gift of a perfect peace. The birth of Jesus does not mean that all our troubles will be out of sight. It doesn't mean all of our problems are going to go away. What it does mean is that we can experience a kind of peace that will not go away even when life is very imperfect. It is a supernatural peace. It is a gift from heaven. We cannot produce it. We can only receive it. It passes every bit of understanding that we have. You cannot explain it, but you also cannot explain it away. And when this peace of God comes, you cannot deny it and life cannot destroy it no matter how hard life gets. Let me tell you something you already know. Life does not recognize your sovereignty. You are not in control. No matter how hard you try to get the people around you to be the people who you want them to be. No matter how hard you try to make the circumstances of your life in order, just like you want them to be in order. Life does not recognize your sovereignty. And here's what you get to control, and it's very big. You get to control who or what will rule your heart. And here's what the Bible would suggest to you. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Let the gift of heaven let the coming of Jesus, let God's perfect plan that has been birthed settle deep inside and let it produce in you what only God can give. A calm, a hope, a resolve, a joy that does not go away when life will not cooperate with the way you want it to. The problem is not that our expectations are way too high. The problem is that we put our expectations in the wrong place. Stop expecting your family to be perfect. Stop expecting perfection from your job or from your friends. Stop expecting your health to always be perfect. Stop expecting your circumstances to always be perfect. In fact, I want to give you a break today. Stop expecting perfection from yourself. What you can expect is that the one who came still comes. And his presence is a perfect gift that will sustain you no matter what is going on in your life. That's because you've stepped into a better story. And stories have the power literally to heal us. So if I were to ask you what is your favorite Christmas movie... I know there are people in this room that would say the movie It's a Wonderful Life is definitely my favorite Christmas story. That's the story of a man named George Bailey whose life is falling apart and in disarray. The role of George Bailey was played by Jimmy Stewart. Jimmy Stewart was a very popular actor. In fact, in 1942, he won an, uh, an Oscar for Best Actor for a movie called The Philadelphia Story. But at that time, our country was in the midst of a very great conflict. Jimmy Stewart didn't want to be just an actor. He wanted to be a soldier. So he joined the military. And the military wanted him to do these film promos that would help young men decide to enlist. But he didn't want to be an actor. He wanted to be a soldier. In fact, that's why he got his commercial pilot's license, so that he could join the Air Force. And after many requests, his desire was finally granted. Jimmy Stewart spent 20 months stationed in England. And as a pilot, he flew many missions over the European theater. And it was hard at times in his life during those experiences in England. 
Because anyone who has been in combat knows it never goes perfect. He had trouble sleeping. He lived on ice cream and peanut butter for months because he couldn't keep food down. And it only got harder when he was asked to be a commander of an entire squadron of B-24 bombers. He wasn't just flying anymore. He was sending young men to fly, and many of them never came back. Two events especially scarred him. One was when 13 planes went down on one mission and 130 young men never came back. And he would write dozens and dozens and dozens of letters to mothers and fathers back in the States saying that their son will not be coming home. And maybe the event that scarred him even more was one particular mission that he was leading and they were going to try to destroy a munitions facility, but their uh, uh, instrument panel man malfunctioned and they dropped their payload of 30 tons of bombs on an innocent French village. And they killed many, many unsuspecting people. So how do, you, how do you recover from that kind of thing? When the war was over, it really was not over for soldiers like Jimmy Stewart. And they sent him to a place that was called Flat Farm. We know now that what he suffered from was called post-traumatic stress disorder. And when he finally went home, his parents did not even recognize Jimmy. He had lost so much weight, his hair had turned gray. And remember, when he left, he was Hollywood's most popular romantic actor. And he didn't look that part anymore. He actually wondered if he'd ever get cast in another film, but he was. In 1946, Frank Capra asked him to play George Bailey, a very desperate and broken man in need of redemption. You see, one reason that Stewart's performance was so powerful was he really didn't have to stretch much to play this character. He was battling his own demons. He wasn't sleeping well. He would fly into fits of rage on the set. At one point, he even screamed to his cast, what's the point in making movies? And all, of all things, the character who played the big bad guy in the movie, Mr. Potter, pulled Jimmy Stewart aside and said to him, have you ever thought that telling a story like this would do the world a lot more good than all the bombs you've ever dropped? And for Jimmy Stewart, he said that was the moment that it was a game changer for me. He began to ponder that the best thing he could do for the world was tell a story about grace and redemption and hope. So when he gets to the end of that movie and he shouts the words, Merry Christmas, Bedford Falls. And you look into the face of George Bailey. And you are looking into the face of a man that was just beginning to really heal. That's the power of a story. See, Christmas reminds us that you and I are part of the greatest story that's ever been told. And it's a true story. It is a story of, of hope and grace and redemption. And it's a story that can heal us and sustain us in this very dark, hard world. Because light has come into this dark world. And the darkness cannot, the darkness will not ever overcome the light. Now I'm going to pray. And when I'm done, I would like for you to go to one of the communion stations. There's four of them around the room. And uh, I want you to take uh, communion. And in the communion trays, they are double stacked. The juice is on the top, and right below that is the second cup that has the bread. And so you will be taking those and, and <laughs> eating the bread and drinking the juice. Uh, and we want you to do that immediately, right while, right while you're there at the table, and you'll place the empty cups in the pitcher there that is provided. We will have someone at the table with gloves on that will be there to uh, give you the, the communion cups. And then there's a candle there that is lit, and you will be given a, a candle with a cup, and you'll light your, your, your candle and go back to your seat, please, as soon as you are done. And when everyone is finished, 
we will all be standing together and we will sing Silent Night together to conclude our time here. So let me pray over you. Stand up. <coughs> Heavenly Father, oh Lord, we thank you so much for the goodness and the grace that you have given us to be a part of the greatest story ever. Thank you, Father, for the true story of Jesus. Thank you that he came to redeem us and save us from our sins. And Lord, we thank you that he is coming back again. May this night be a night that we honor you and celebrate that fact. In Christ's name.